Good morning. Come on in. Let's all stand together. How's everyone doing? Good morning. Welcome to Grace Fellowship Church. We're happy that you've come. I know that everybody comes in different states of mind. Some of us with joy in our hearts, knowing how faithful the Lord is. Some of us with joy in our hearts, knowing that God is faithful through the most difficult of times. And, uh, and we know that we have a loving God. We know that we come together to worship a loving God and, and a God who meets us exactly where we are. So thank him for that this morning. As, uh, as I pray God's blessing uh, over this place and over you, his people, and over us this morning, would you reflect on the God that you serve, that loving God who meets you exactly where you are and exactly where you need him to meet you. Would you bow with me? God, as we enter into this time, we trust your hand in our lives. We trust the way that you enter into our hearts. We trust that you know exactly what we need. We trust that you are faithful. We trust that you are good. God, we need you to be that way. We need you. We need to be able to trust you and lean on you and rest on your promises. You are so good. You are so good always, Lord. And your promise is to be with us, to never forsake us, certainly in an eternal sense, but also in the immediate. And we are so grateful, God, that you walk step by step with the people who have put their faith in your son, Jesus. And we have, most of us in here, and we thank you. And we praise him, and we praise you, and we trust your spirit this morning, God. In the name of Jesus, bless this time. Amen. Let's sing about that good and loving and eternal God, future past. You hold the reins on the sun and the moon. Lord of lords, king of kings, that's who you are. You cover the mountains, the valleys below. With the breath of the almighty wings, all treasures. All oh, treasures of wisdom and things to be known And hidden inside your hands And in this fortunate turn of events You ask me to be your friend Oh, you ask me to be
eternal God, the creator of all things, the sustainer of our breath, the deliverer of his people, and the one who will be in the end victorious. We thank you so much, God, for your plan, for being a part of that plan. God, would you help us to do that this morning? Shore us up. Give us your tenderness this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Please go ahead and have a seat, everybody.
Good morning, everyone. Let there be light. Uh, so good to see you. Really good to be together uh, once again. I just got back last night, late last night, um, from a little personal retreat. We try to encourage our pastoral staff to to get away for a week-ish, um, uh, once a year, just to kind of do some uh, some spiritual, personal work, if you will, uh, just to check in with the Lord and uh, and to make sure all the you're doing okay, basically, and and do business with Him and rest and and restore. And so I had this really neat opportunity this year to uh, to go out to South Wales, a place called uh, Faldy Brennan uh, that some of you might be familiar with. There's been been a couple books uh, written about it. It's a prayer house out there, and just some really honestly, remarkable things that God has done uh, at that place, through that place, uh, over the years. And so, anyway, it's a trek to get out there. I drove from, from London all the way across the country to get there. Uh, in, uh, and I've driven, you know, on the other side of the road and the other side of the car, but not single-track ro- roads before, which means it's, you're, you're the only car that can get there, so that's quite tricky and interesting. And... Uh, and I learned something about myself. I really don't like to screw up and look like I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so it was quite stressful to try to maintain your composure in that kind of environment. But um, anyway, I have a picture of where I stayed, um, I think, in here, if this is on. Uh, I was like a hobbit on this trip, basically. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's Faldy Brennan. That's actually that's where I slept. the The room was so tiny you couldn't believe it. I really felt like a hobbit. And uh, uh, and then the prayer house where you gather for prayer is just right below that. But the the property was was remarkable. And um, and I had just lots of times. To, I went by myself. Uh, there was other people there from really all over the world that were kind of there for their own reasons. Uh, and we'd, we'd uh, enter into kind of the rhythms of prayer that they, they observe uh, every day. And so you do that. But I kind of went off um, most days on my own to, uh, oops, there we go. Okay. That is the Pembroke, uh, Pembrokeshire uh, coast. Uh, that is a kind of, there's a trail, a coastal trail there. So I logged a lot of miles uh, along the cliffs there and uh, and elsewhere around. It was remarkable beauty. And, uh, you know, just being with the Lord uh, is interesting. You know, sometimes you think about, like, you're in that kind of place. You're by yourself. You're praying with the Lord. It's going to be all good. And it was, a lot of it was all good. And a lot of it was challenging, too. I wrestled a lot with the Lord. And, and I just had some things that were have been kind of bugging me the last couple years sort of in the background, background noise for me, and, uh, and so I kind of did business with the Lord along those lines, but it was really <clears throat> a great opportunity to go. I know a number of you knew I was going, uh, were praying for me, uh, and I'm really grateful, honestly, for that. I really felt the Lord was kind of doing some good internal work for me, and uh, so I came back. I wouldn't say physically refreshed, because uh, I was super active. Uh, but I think just it was what I needed emotionally and internally, so I'm really grateful I had the opportunity to do that. Um, anyway, but I'm back and glad to be back, and uh, as you can tell as you walked in, we have a lot going on uh, this Sunday, uh, all the festive stuff going out there on our patio. Uh, that's because today is our fall kickoff, and what that means is a registration officially is open for all our fall ministries uh, that will be starting roughly around mid-September. Um, we really want you to go out there. If you're unfamiliar with those ministries, this is a great opportunity for you to find out more. There's going to be people at the tables. They'd love to uh, talk to you about it, answer any questions you might have. Um, we've got various treats for you to take home and some to eat, um, so take advantage uh, of that. Uh, but one thing, and I, I don't know if the, this video g- came out yet or not, but... Um, uh, I recorded a video recently that was sent out in an email along yeah, these it sends, oh, goes out today. Um, but what I really want, what I say in that, what I really wanted to emphasize uh, to you this morning is um, we really think it's important, we really feel it's important that your involvement in this community goes beyond just simply participating on a Sunday morning. And you've heard me say that 
uh, before, but we, we feel a core goal for us is that you are part of a small group discipleship context because we feel like that is really the best kind of context for you to really kind of plug in in some meaningful ways uh, relationally within this church, but also to just to grow in your life of faith uh, as well. To be able to dive into God's word together and to work that out. To be able to get real and honest about our lives, which can be scary. You know, it's scary to be known, <laughs> but to be really known and to be loved is, that's where it's at. And that's what we really want. Um, to support each other and to encourage each other uh, and to bear with one another's burdens because we know what our burdens are and so we can help share the load. Um, and uh, and you know, as many of you know, and I've mentioned this you know, a few times before from up here, but um, just in light of the fact of what our family went through for the last couple years and what we sort of had to absorb, which was really, really difficult, we couldn't have done that without the support of just faithful, loving friends who kind of knew what was going on, uh, knew us, and was, were able to just come alongside us and support us and love us. And so that's kind of what we need to be for each other uh, here at church. And so really want to say to you, if you're not a part of a small group discipleship context, whether it's a home group or Axios group, men's ministries, whatever, uh, women's ministries, whatever it might be, really want you to do that. And that's your first step, is to go out there uh, and do that. Um, and since I'm standing up here, I'm going to just begin by talking about Axios real quick. Um, there it is. Thank you, because I wasn't very good at that. Um, uh, Axios is kicking off September 16th, another year. We've been doing this uh, for the last, what, is, what is, has it been now? Like maybe 13 years or something like that. And, um, and this year, we're going to be doing something a little different than we've done before. We're going to do a character study on the life of David. And so um, uh, this will be uh, really interesting. I was really kind of inspired when Dave was kind of going through uh, the life of Moses, and it was just so interesting to kind of look at Scripture through the lens of a person and how God uh, works through that person. And David is this remarkably complex character. And those of you who know his story, most of you probably do, uh, he was called a man after God's own heart, but we know what he did and how messy his life was and the consequences that, that he suffered, uh, not just in his own life, but even for the kingdom of Israel because of it. And so it's, it's a, the depth and complexity is, I think, interesting. I mean, he was an amazing person. He was a warrior, a poet, uh, uh, a musician. He wrote most of the Psalms. Uh, he was a great statesman, a king, of course, uh, but he was a great sinner, but he really loved the Lord uh, in the midst of all of it. And so it, it'll be really fun to explore uh, this man over the course of this year. Um, so if you're not a part of Axios, if, you, if you're a guy, we generally meet on Friday mornings, so there are a few groups that meet other times during the week. I uh, really want you to consider doing that, but not just to take my word for it, um, I've asked Jeff uh, Blyde to come up here. Jeff's been a part of, um, uh, come on up, Jeff. Uh, Jeff's been a part of our group for the last, I think, three years, has it, has it Four. been? Four. yeah. So, uh, Jeff, just share a bit about your experience. All right, raise your hand if you're not in Axios. <laughs> just kidding. Oh, I, oh, it's some women, that's great, yeah. <laughs> fair, fair. Uh, I have been in Axios for four years, going on five, and uh, in many ways, uh, I try not to exaggerate, but it has been a lifeline uh, for me, my faith, and my family. Um, kind of in general, uh, it's just a great group. Um, so our group has maintained a lot of the same uh, individuals for the last four years. We also have some people come and go, but it is a core sense of friendship. Um, there are just guys who uh, our church is blessed with a ridiculous amount of good people here. People who have mature faiths, and uh, this is a way in which um, I, right, I just get to know some of them. In my group, it's a little unique. Um, we have a real diversity of ages, and one of the reasons we came to this church is to experience some of that within our lives. And so I'm just, I love the fact that I can talk with guys who... Uh, <laughs> Right, they've been wiped out a few times, and it's just good to, good to hear the testimony of someone who's been faithful through that. 
for 30 years. So great place to uh, get connected specifically with the guys in the group. Um, accountability is another one. And, uh, you know, we, I got a young family. We have work. Uh, I have work, things like that. Uh, some days, some weeks, uh, because of Axios, that's the only time I read the Bible, right? And so <laughs> for that alone, uh, if you ever have a hard time reading the Bible or fitting that into your schedule, this is accountability because you show up, you talk about it, and uh, you want to make sure you honor that commitment. Uh, the support, we, we talk about the Bible, uh, what God does within it, and then what he does outside of that in each other's lives. This is the biggest thing I get from Axios is the support of uh, my group there. What that looks like uh, this year, um, two, uh, well, the biggest thing, we had uh, in my family an unexpected death of a brother-in-law who was uh, in his 20s. Completely unexpected, incredibly tragic, and that just put our family in a deep state of grief, um, depression, there's, there's just, you know, what do we do? Anger at times, uh, and just talking to God about, you know, why does that happen? Where's your mercy in that? Uh, so I showed up to Axios, and I texted the guys and saying, I'm having a hard week. I showed up and said, I just need prayer. And uh, I had nine guys lay hands on me for 20 minutes, praying for me and my family. And that helped my family, you know, my, my in-laws and everybody. And uh, for the next few weeks, they, they would text me. Uh, we continued to pray about it. And that just got, that got me through an incredibly, the hardest time this year for my life that, that time. Uh, in that context, like Mark was saying, in a small group, we have relationship, we're walking through life. Um, I, I couldn't do it without them. So do join a group if you are not in one. Really appreciate that, Jeff. Um, so there's the pitch. Uh, encourage all you men to be part of this if you could. Uh, there's other opportunities uh, uh, for men too if that date doesn't work. And, and, and I know there's a group of uh, men, uh, older men. We'll talk about that later on in the week, weeks ahead. Uh, if you want to meet at a different time, uh, doing a different thing, but uh, really important, uh, we think, for us to be a part of something like this and want to emphatically encourage you to be a part of it. All right, with that said, let us take some time now to dive into God's Word together. Uh, so open your Bibles, if you would. Uh, we are going to be in Psalm 33 today, and Sandy Moody will be reading our passage for this morning. So Sandy, come on up. There you are. Uh, please join me and stand for the reading of God's word. Psalm 33. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout. For joy, for the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars, and he puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do, 
No king is saved by the size of his army. No warriors escape by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all of its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those who hope in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our hope and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord even as we put our hope in you. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Good to be with you all. We have been going through the Psalms this summer, and I'll say, you know, We've taken on some tough psalms, uh, and we have a psalm of praise today, but we've looked at sin, we've looked at fretting, we've looked at anger, we've looked at lament. I figure it was time to give us, you know, a little respite, and we're going to kind of land the plane in August with some really delightful, wonderful psalms of praise and and gratitude and all of that. So um, I hope that today is an encouragement to you, and what I want to do today is a psalm of praise, and I want to do something a little different. I want to... I want to kind of take this opportunity to, to think together about what do we do when we gather here every Sunday. Um, we come here, obviously, to worship and praise the Lord. We do that uh, in a bunch of ways, you know, mainly in song. And that's what I want to talk about today. And we don't talk about the why that often. We just come in here and we do it. Uh, but I think it's helpful, since we come week after week, to step back and go, what, what are we doing again? Why, why, do we, why do we do this? Like, we give about a quarter of our service to singing. Um, why? What are, we, what are we hoping to happen in that time? What's this all about? And so I kind of want to talk about that today and use this psalm as um, some of the language of the psalm to think about what is it that we're trying to do when we gather every Sunday in worship and praise of God, all right? And so uh, before we, we launch to the psalm, I, I just want you to take a moment to ask yourself, what, what is your experience of corporate worship? Okay, on Sunday mornings. I know, I know worship is 24-7, right? Worship is a, it's a 24-7 response, God. But I'm specifically talking about corporate worship. We gather to, to sing and praise God. What is your experience of that? Okay, what's your honest experience of that? Just take a moment. Like, yeah, how does that go for me? And uh, you might, you're going to fall into one of three categories. Probably one is like, it's awesome. I love coming in here week after week and singing these songs and worshiping, hearing the voices and the music and praising God. I love it, okay? So you, you might fit into that category, or uh, you probably, you may fit into a, it's kind of hit and miss for me, right? Some Sundays are great, some Sundays are not, some Sundays I'm there, some Sundays I'm just not feeling it, I don't know why, but it, it's kind of a hit and miss experience for me. Uh, and some of you might fit into a third category, which is honestly, it's really challenging for me. Um, it's rarely super uh, exciting and, and kind of satisfying to me. There's, there's a lot of complexity to coming into a room with all these people and coming to, to a church at all. And there's just, it's just a lot of complexity for me. It's, it's rarely a really freeing, wonderful experience, okay? You fit into one of those categories, and we maybe we go in and out of those categories, but I just want you to be thinking about, like, what, what is this like for me? And what I want to do today is just kind of try to remind us, this is, gonna be, this is not going to be new to most of you, just remind us, what are we trying to do here? Why are we doing this? Uh, and give us a fresh vision, again, for, for worshiping together every Sunday morning. So you up for that? Yeah, good, okay. Um, so th- what the psalm does Basically, verse 1 through 3 is the call to worship. In a couple different ways, the psalmist is calling us to worship. And then in verse 4 through the rest of the psalm, it's giving us reasons why God is worthy of worship. Okay? And I'm going to spend actually most of my time on that first part, just the call to worship. And, uh, but then we'll also talk at the end about why is God so worthy of worship. All right? So let's look at verse 1 through 3. I noticed a couple different things as I was studying this this week that I think are worth saying. Verse 1 says this, sing joyfully 
to the Lord. That's how the psalm starts. And I couldn't help but think how many psalms have a very similar call. Sing joyfully. It's the pairing of music with joy. Okay, those two things brought together. You see that throughout the psalms. Lots of joy in the psalms, right? Lots of sorrow, but lots of joy. Words like rejoice, be glad, shout for joy, our psalm says later. Delight in God, praise, worship, and adore, right? Joy, adoration, those kinds of emotions. And then lots of music in the psalms, right? So most of the psalms were prayers that were put to music and, and played corporately. Uh, in our passage, we have some musical instruments mentioned, right? We've got the ten-stringed lyre and the harp in verse 2. Uh, other psalms mention other instruments. Uh, the cymbals, it's nice for you percussionists, cymbals, drums get their place in the psalms. The clapping of hands, the shouting of voices, the dancing, right? There's, there's a lot of musicality in the psalms. And this may be so obvious, but I, I think it's worth stepping back every once in a while and asking why. Why do we come together and do music when we gather? Okay, and Almost in society, that, no one else does that in society. No, people don't just get together and start singing together. right? Why do we have music here? Uh, some of us are musically gifted. Some of us are musically challenged. right? Why do we do music? Or to put it another way, we could do all the same things without music. Right? We could, we could recite passages of Scripture together. We could recite these psalms. We could have poems written that we just recite together. Why do we sing instead of recite? Right? And the answer, I think, is fairly obvious. <laughs> but we're saying it's because music stirs the heart. And what I love about music, it, your level of musical giftedness has very little to do with how much you love music. Right? Some really bad musicians who love music. And I love that. But music stirs the heart. Music affects the emotions. That's the big gain that music brings to this time. And so when we talk about worship, I just want to start there by saying we have this God who all the time is saying, when you gather together, I don't want you just to recite. I want you to sing. I want you to clap. I want you to play. I want you to dance. You name it. We're not going to be dancing here probably. That's not our style, you know. But um, <laughs> this is what I want happening when we're together, and it seems to me we have a God who says, when you gather together to worship me, I want your hearts to be stirred. I want your passions to be roused. Why? Because we have a God who says, I'm not just a God to be obeyed. I'm not just a God to be served or given allegiance to. I am a God to be enjoyed. I'm a God to be delighted in. I'm a God to find pleasure and joy in. Right? I want to be delighted. I want to be enjoyed. I want to be treasured by you. I don't just want your obedience. I want your hearts. Okay? That's the kind of God I am. I love, I, I was thinking again, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, first question, what is the chief end of man? Right? And I love the answer to this question. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. And every time I see that, that word enjoy catches me off guard. This is our purpose in life. This is why God created us, is to glorify him and to find joy in him. He wants to be enjoyed. Um, I, I was at a wedding last weekend and wasn't doing the wedding, but I was there. And at the reception, uh, there was a guy coming out of the drink line and he had one drink for himself and probably one drink for his spouse. And he comes out of the drink line and I was introduced to him as Pastor Dave. Okay, which I'm never introduced that way, okay? I prefer father. As Pastor Dave is so <laughs> presumptuous, you know. But uh, I never that, but I was introduced as Pastor Dave. And so this guy has, uh, he's double fist and drinks, and he sees Pastor Dave, and, he, and, he, and the look on his face was just price like this. Oh, and he kind of articulated, oh, I'm so sorry, you know. <laughs> I'm like, I'm in the drink line too. We're okay here, you know. <laughs> but, but, but I thought like, that's how, honestly, that's how we think about God sometimes, right? Like, there's these things that I want out of life, uh, but, and then there's God, and God is there to kind of put a damper on these things that I love and that, that I want, that I really enjoy. And uh, I think 
the music of the psalm speaks to a God who says, no, I, I'm not here to, to, to take away all your joy. I, I actually want you to channel that joy into the right places because that's where it will find its deepest, truest fulfillment. Um, C.S. Lewis has this great line uh, from the, his little uh, sermon, actually, The Weight of Glory, which you've heard me read like once a year. But I love it. If we consider the unblushing promises of reward in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but actually too weak, right? We're half-hearted creatures. We're fooling about with drink, sex, and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he can't imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. Right? We are far too easily pleased. You read the Gospels, you read, you read this, the Scriptures, and you have this God who is saying, I am here to bring you joy, and I alone know how you can find it and find it to its full and find it for eternity. And part of what I love about music is God says, when my people gather, I want them to sing because I want their hearts. I'm not just after their obedience. Uh, I want their joys and their passions. And so that's the first thing that we need to rem remember about worship is is we have a God who wants to be enjoyed. He wants to be delighted in. And part of that is we get to sing uh, and sing with joy. All right, so that's sing joyful to the Lord. Secondly, look at the next phrase in verse 1. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. That's what my translation says. So, meaning it, it's an appropriate, it's, it's right, it's entirely reasonable and, and the, the appropriate thing to do. So, the first idea is there's, there's a passion to our worship, but the second is there's such an appropriateness <laughs> to, to the worship of God. And, and we know that the English word worship comes from an old English word, which was worth-ship, right? So what the essence of worship is, is simply declaring the worth of somebody or something, right? And there's a lot of things that we find worthy, but if you think uh, of all things in the universe, what could be more worthy than the the one who created it, who sustains it, the savior of all, the one who, who has set this whole thing in motion, is in charge of it all, and is more glorious than anything else in the world, he alone is worthy of true worship. And so worshiping God is an entirely fitting <laughs> and right and appropriate thing to do. And I was thinking this week, uh, there's so much in our world today, in our lives today, that uh, would prevent us from worship right? Like I was thinking, there, there's so much in, in our lives that turns us inward to turning inside and thinking about ourselves a lot, okay? We're a very therapeutic culture, which is not a bad thing in and of itself. We, there's a lot of self-help, self-actualization. Uh, even advertisement is, is ha ha, you know, having us look inside and, and there, you know, the, the desire. So there's a lot turning us inward. There's a lot turning us outward to the world right now. Social media, the news, it's, it's getting us to think all about what's going on out there. There's very little in our daily lives that is turning us upward, right? There's a lot here, there's a lot there, but there's, there's very little turning us upward. And, and what, what worship is, is it's that refocus of the gaze, right? All week long, my eyes are, are here, my eyes are here, my eyes are doing things. And, and what I do when I come to this room is I, I refocus my gaze on the one who is most worthy of my attention, most worthy of my praise, who is the most glorious being in the universe. And that's an utterly appropriate and fitting thing to do. And so I want to just, these first two points, I kind of want to see them as not contrast, but maybe compliments to each other, okay? If the first one says um, there's a passion, and when we come in here, we ought to, our hearts ought to be stirred, and that's very true. The second point is, but guess what? We can worship whether we're feeling it or not, okay? It's always still the right thing to do, and, and I think that's really great because realistically, uh, I, I mean, most of us, worship is a hit and miss experience, Right? I mean, you have those, those Sundays where it's like, oh, that was so, I just, I could get picture the Lord and my heart was stirred. But you'll have just as many Sundays where it's like, mm, you know, not really feeling it. I don't, I don't even know why. The same place, same time, and I just, I'm not feeling it, right? We, that, that emotional world goes up and down. And what's beautiful is you can worship <laughs> whether you're feeling it or not. It's still 
the right and appropriate thing to do. And, and a way that I think we need to actually think about worship is think about worship as not just expression and joy, but worship is also a form of training, okay? So we come in here, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to retrain our hearts and our minds to be moving towards the thing that is most worthy of being moved towards. Um, I was thinking this week about this. So uh, you wouldn't know it from this impressive frame before you, uh, but turns out I have a few physical problems with my body, okay? I've got some shoulder problems, low back problem, uh, and it's been like 10, 15 years going. And this year I've got a, a friend of mine who's um, just been wonderful in this. He's helping me through a series of kind of, uh, I'd say, physical therapy training. But what we're doing is um, I'm unlearning a lot of things. I, we're retraining my basic movement patterns. Like, no, your body's not meant to bend there. It's meant to bend there, okay? This should be stable. This is the thing that should be moving. And it's been slow for me trying to figure this out, but we're literally rewiring my body to move the way it was designed. We're actually, we, we talk about how babies go from their backs to, to their front and how they crawl. Like, this is how the body was designed to move. And I got away with bad movements in my youth, and now I'm not getting away with it in my, in my middle age, right, my mid-40s. Um, but it's just a rewiring of my movement patterns. And really, that's, that's actually what we're doing in worship, <laughs> right? We are, we are rewiring, in this case, our minds and our hearts. All week long, we're kind of doing something, and, and we're kind of just doing the movements we, we, we do. But what we do here is, in a sense, we're training, okay? We're, 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 we're fixing our minds on the thing that is most appropriate, the way we were originally designed, actually. But in a fallen world, we, we lose that. And so I, I just want to say, we come in here and we bring as much passion as we can, and it's right and good. But we also, we can say that you can worship whether or not you're feeling it. Because the essence of worship is simply declaring who God is. And that, that is always a fitting and appropriate thing. And we're training ourselves over time to, to fix our minds on what is most important. All right. You with me? Okay, yeah. good. I knew Scott Owen would say yes. <laughs> Speaking of Scott Owen, uh, verse 3. Sing to him a new song. And I was thinking, that's a repeated command in the psalm. Sing a new song. Sing a new song. This psalm, Psalm 33, at the time was a newly penned song. And so the psalm seemed to be saying, there should be new songs that you're singing. And I assume there's two reasons for that. One is because God is always doing new things in our lives, right? New acts of favor and, and faithfulness that ah, that demands a new song. Or God is still the same God he always is, um, but those same truths, those old eternal truths need to be expressed in new and fresh ways, right? Both reasons to have new songs. And I was thinking, you know, we, we've worked so hard at Grace. You know, every church has to navigate um, songs. And, and we have tried to kind of toe this line of what we call blended worship, where you have a combination of, of older songs or hymns, right, and with newer songs. And we've, we've, some churches, you know, just say we're doing all new or we're staying all old, or some divide, we're going to have a, an early service that's all old and an, a 1030 that's all new songs, right? And we have intentionally said we're not going to do that here. We, we want to have the, the, the best of the old and the best of the new, and that's how we do things here. And we've been very intentional about that. So um, once a month, I, I said Scott's name, we do um, something called New Song Tuesday, just, I just wanted to, today, I thought I'd give you guys a little insight into kind of how we think about these things. And so Mark and Scott and Joel and I get together for lunch, and, um, and usually Scott or someone will bring a, a new song or two. And, but it's like new songs, like there's a gauntlet that a new song in that crew that has to get through <laughs> to make it to here, um, which that's just how we think about it. And so, you know, it's like, is it theologically rich? Is it theologically accurate? Is it singable? Is it artistically compelling, right? We have all these parameters that, like, most songs just kind of die. It's like American Ninja Warrior, and the songs kind of, like, get to stage three, and then they die, you know? Um, it's, it's funny, like, when you bring the new song, you're kind of insecure, like, 
I kind of like the song, but you know how it's going to go, so you don't like, you know, it's, it's a really interesting dynamic. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I didn't like that song either. Stupid idea, <laughs> you know. Um, but what we're trying to do is, is have that, you know, the blend of old and new that ultimately we just want good songs. So we don't really care, you know, <laughs> in the end if they're old or new. We want them to be good. We want them to be worshipful. And, and so, but you see that, this, this sing a new song. Uh, and then finally, one other thing I'd like to say about verse 1 and 3 don't worry, I'm about halfway done, so we're not going to take this verse by verse, um, is the last thing. So you have sing joyfully, you have it's fitting, you have sing a new song, and then the end of verse 3, it says, play skillfully. And I like that. Um, when you sing to me, or when you play for me, God's saying, I want it to be good. I want it to be excellent. I want it to be quality. And, you know, we're, we have a culture that is so, um, we just want to be authentic. That's kind of like, well, shouldn't God just as long as it's authentic, and in one sense, I think God cares about the heart. But I, I love that we have a God that says, no, I, I want your best. I, I, want, I want it to be good. <laughs> and, uh, and we aim for that on Sundays as well. And what, the phrase we use is, we want to have undistracting excellence. So it's a quality of music that, that is not distracting. It doesn't draw attention to itself, right? But, and it's not distracting because bad music's really distracting. Um, too, but it's a, a, a simple excellence that uh, ab- enables all of us to be the, the choir, to sing without distraction. And so I love that, that, that I would just say for our team that we have a group of, of worshipers who are not trying to perform for you all, you know, who are really quality musicians, but are, are trying to serve us in a way that isn't distracting, and, but it is quality and good and allows us just to freely worship the Lord. And we want that, and I love that we have that in our teams. I'm really grateful for that. Yes. Yep. So there's the call to worship. Worship with your hearts, but it's also training. Um, ever new, ever old, and with skill. Okay? So let me do this. I'm just going to take five minutes now, um, and I want to direct our minds to why God is worthy of worship, and then we'll have the team come up, and they will direct our minds and our hearts uh, through song, and we'll sing a couple songs together just in worship and praise of our God. Okay, so I'm not going to go through this whole psalm, obviously, but I, just three really obvious reasons why God is worthy that I want to uh, bring out in this psalm. First, he is worthy because he is Lord of all creation, okay? Let me read verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. Okay, there was a time. Actually, there was not a time, because time didn't exist at that point. But there was a time when there was nothing. Right? There was no space-time continuum, but there was this eternal, infinite being who somehow is a communion of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and in infinite creativity dreamed up a world okay, out of nothing, and then an infinite power by the breath of his mouth, simply through his speaking, made it happen. <laughs> Just brought into being by thinking it and speaking it out into reality, okay? I love that phrase, uh, verse 6, their starry host, right? All the stars in the galaxies. Um, are any of you following the, uh, the pictures of the NASA Webb telescope? You heard about this, right? We had Hubble, the Hubble telescope, right, that you launch into, like, orbit, and it's, it's a telescope in orbit. Now they've put a new one out there. It's, like, deep orbit, and it's way more powerful than Hubble, which is saying something. And so we're slowly getting pictures that are being released day after day, week after week. So this is all very current right now. So you're getting these pictures of, like, deep space. Um, but the one that I, I was really fascinated about, um, this is called, this, this, that big one there, it looks like a jellyfish kind of, is called a cartwheel galaxy, okay? And it, uh, <laughs> it's the product of two galaxies having a high-speed collision with each other, okay? Not two stars, 
two galaxies, two spiral galaxies colliding, right, at almost light speed. And so what you have is this explosion in this new galaxy. And so you have, and the, you can still see kind of the spokes of a spiral galaxy, but towards the edges is just basically stardust <laughs> from a collision, <laughs> okay? So millions of stars in each of these galaxies colliding together, creating this, what they call a cartwheel galaxy full of stars and star dust. <laughs> I just think that's amazing, right? He breathes and it just happens. <laughs> this is who he is, right? Um, look at verse 13. From heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. Okay, currently there's about 7.8 billion human beings on the planet. And God has fashioned the heart of every single one of them. He sees every single one of them and considers every single thing they do. I remember I was on a mission trip one time and we ended up in Thailand and Carrie and I are on this little river uh, and we're seeing on the banks of the river these little huts with these Thai kids jumping in and out of the river. You know, it's like these people who have such a vastly different experience of life <laughs> than I do in Orange County. And thinking God, God sees these kids just as much as he ever see, saw me. And like what kind of a being can possibly hold the thoughts and desires and purposes of 7.8 billion people in his mind instantaneously, right? How is that even, and created the hearts of all of them. So this is why God is worthy. <laughs> he is the Lord of creation, right? He creates the billions of stars. He creates the billions of hearts. And what we do on Sundays is we step in here Sunday after Sunday and we remember something fundamental about existence, which is this. My life is very contingent on another being. I'm utterly dependent on another being. This next breath, I have been given by someone who is not me. <laughs> and this whole thing could just unravel and disappear in an instant if he didn't continue in his powerful word to sustain it moment by moment. And so it is right and fitting and entirely appropriate that Sunday after Sunday we come to the one who is the unmoved mover who created it all and say, you are worthy, right? Because by your will, all things were created and have their being. You're the Lord of all creation. You're also the Lord of all human history. And I'll just read the verse. Look at verse 10. He's the Lord of creation. He's the Lord of history. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. You know, every human being makes plans, right? All day long, we're, we're plan-making people. There's purposes in our hearts. And nations we here uh, have, have plans and purposes, right? And in the context of this psalm, the plans of the nations are generally evil plans. They're plans for domination. They're plans for power. Uh, they're plans for even war and violence. But there is a being beyond this created world, and he has plans of his own. And he has a will of his own. And he has purposes of his own. And in the end, guess whose plans and purposes will stand, <laughs> right? Not the plans of created beings, but the plans and purposes of a created God. His will be the ones left standing at the end of the day. And Christ will return, and the plans of the nations, every nation will be thwarted, and God will establish his kingdom with his king and his Messiah, and his kingdom will be the one that lasts forever. And so what we do every Sunday is we come in here, and we worship the one who is Lord of history. And we come in here and we say, God, all week long, I've been planning stuff. I've been working on stuff. I have dreams and hopes, but 
in this moment, what I need to do is I, I kind of need to surrender all of that again to you, to your throne, because in the end, your plans and your purposes are the ones that will last. So that's what we do in worship. We, we surrender our plans and purposes again every Sunday. We recenter our hearts around God's story. We remind ourselves, this story is not about me. <laughs> this story is about God. I am a character for sure, a bit part in God's grand story. And worship is resetting ourselves, rewiring our minds to re- remind ourselves of that. And then finally, I'll just say this. He is the Lord of creation. He is the Lord of history. But not just that, he's also a God of unfailing love. And I love that most of all. Look at verse 5, second half of verse 5. The earth is full of his unfailing love. You look around the earth, all over the place there's examples of the unfailing love of God. Verse 8, or verse 18, sorry. The eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love. And then finally it ends in verse 22. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. And this is the great rounding out of the character of God. He's not just big, sovereign Lord of creation, Lord of history. He's also God of faithful, unending love. This is that Hebrew word, chesed, that sticky, I will stand by you through thick and thin, can't get rid of me if you tried, faithful till the end, kind of love of God that he has for his people. This is who he is. He is a God of unfailing love. And so every Sunday we come in here, right? And we, again, we recenter our hearts and minds around this truth. What defines my life most, God, is your unfailing love, okay? What defines my life most is not the successes I had this week or the failures I had this week, right? It's not my joys. It's not my sorrows. Those are all parts of my life. But what is most true about my identity and my life is that I am a recipient of your unfailing love. And that's what unites all of us in this room together. And so we gather together to acknowledge the unfailing love of the Lord. Amen? So that's why we do this week after week. We come with passion, but we also come and do what is most fitting, which is to acknowledge the worth of the creator, the Lord of all, the one who loves his people with a never-ending love. So let me pray for us, and then let's sing, hopefully with joy. Well, Father, on this this beautiful summer morning, uh, we are here to really just declare your worth. In the end, Sundays are about you, and they're for you. And so I pray that as we, as we have this rhythm every week, w- would you inspire fresh vision for us, fresh passion for us? May this be a place, week after week, where we experience your goodness, we experience your sovereign purposes, we experience your unfailing love, uh, we experience freedom, and we experience uh, just a safe wonderful place to be the body of Christ together. And even now as we sing to you, would you would you stir in our hearts, but also stir these lyrics that we would focus on them. We would consider the truths that they declare, that that might stir our hearts, Lord. So we give you glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we stand for these songs? And also that we have our prayer team that will be out. We'll, we'll open up those doors right now. They'll be in the living room space as an act of worship, prayer, receiving prayer is a great thing to do. We'll have someone right here. Sandy's right here. She's doubling in as scripture reader and prayer today. But let us sing to the Lord. And sings my soul, I sing. How great thou art, and sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art, how great thou art, O oh Lord my God, when I Oh,
Christ shall come with shout of acclamation.
powerful name. It is the name of Jesus. Let's sing, you have no rival. That's the God we serve. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. And what a powerful name it is. Yes, Lord, we worship you in this place. We praise your name, Jesus. We thank you for all that you give us and the continued love and support that we have from you as a creator and a friend. Hallelujah, God, for Jesus. Let's sing the doxology together to send us out. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's go enjoy the patio, enjoy these ministries. Go in God's grace. Amen.